across the point, the Germans from shell to shell to crater to crater, uh, trying to get over to the west side of the point, which was where I had three gun emplacements to take out. I got there and there wasn't any evidence that a gun had ever been in any of them. I was angry. I was angry because some stupid intelligence was not working. And here we are rescuing a lot of guys' lives to get up there to knock these guns out and it's the business of intelligence to tell us whether they're there or not. And we were led to believe they were there and they weren't there. And we pursued this matter after the battle was over with the uh, uh, French underground and they swore to us that they had given the information to the proper channels. Nobody got it, and nobody told us, and we lost a lot of guys. 81 killed with me that day. Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only help shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. To show you a list of, I think it's about 400 and some guys that were killed in this World War II. Um, it was a failure on somebody's part not to get that information to us, because they had it, and we never found out who that one was. But you moved away from Point de Hoc in search of the guns. Who made that decision and I why? I did. And why? Uh, well, uh, Colonel Rudder had taken the point, and he was in command of the point, had a uh, CP there uh, with a first aid station or a little uh, field hospital. and. Uh, so when my guys and I saw that uh, there weren't any guns on the point, and, and we looked all over, it was about 30, 40 acres, and we couldn't see, and these are big guns. Um, so we said, well, we're going to have to, we had a three-part mission, the actual mission for the, for the 225 rangers that were on Point Dock. The, their sole mission was three-pronged. One, and most important, get the guns and destroy them, put them out of action, make them in Two get to the coast road, set up a roadblock so the Germans in the Utah Beach to the west can't get through us at the point to get to Omaha because Omaha's having no trouble. And we're to stop the Germans to do that. Uh, that was the second part. The third part was uh, destroy all the German communications. Well, we, we destroy all the German communications. We set up the roadblock. We manned it. I started off with 25 guys. By the time I got there within the hour and got to the guns, I only had uh, about 10 or 12 left. So uh, we wound up uh, with 10 or 12 guys holding all the Germans out of Omaha Beach uh, in our roadblock. Uh, however, uh, while our men were uh, fine-tuning their positions, you might say, uh, Sergeant Kuhn, my company commander, says, well, now you take that second platoon in. That's all I was to it, and I did. <coughs> and I had been there first sergeants from day one anyway. I knew them all well. Um, 
So how did you? How did I feel? Is that what your question was? How did I feel? Well, you know, uh, nothing special. Let me say this: a leader, no matter what he is, enlisted man or an officer, has so much on his mind when he's leading and he's doing the thinking, and um, you don't have time to think about yourself. It's the poor private who has nothing on his mind but his own life. Uh, he can get mighty nervous uh, because it gets kind of hairy. Um, no, I, I was just out to kill every Nazi I could, uh, quickly as I could, because I figured he's after me, it's him or me, and uh, here I am, 82 years old, and living good. But where were the Costa guns? And what did you do to them when right. you found them? Uh, I got out to the road. We uh, set up the roadblock. There was this uh, road down between two pastures, and I saw markings in the dirt, like maybe a farm wagon. I didn't know what it was. Uh, but I, uh, I said to Jack, I said, Jack, let's go see what that is. I, I don't know what it is. I never thought it would be the guns, but it might have been some weapons carriers. I don't know. So we leapfrog, you know, he would protect me as I went forward 50 uh, feet or 100 feet, and I'd observe while he came up to me, and then we protect each other going in line. We went in a couple hundred yards, came my turn to run up and look over the next hedgerow, and I uh, looked over the hedgerow, and I said, Jack, here they are. Uh, there were five of these big 155-millimeter uh, coastal uh, artillery pieces, um, in, a, in an apple orchard, in a swale, a little valley. You see, the cliffs are one thing out here on this channel, but up on top of those cliffs, they go down gradually into the meadows and into the uh, swamps and things. So uh, Jack came over with me, and we sat there, and we looked and said, where the hell are they? And then we saw these uh, Germans over in a field about 75 to 100 yards away. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. It's D-Day, 8 o'clock in the morning, and they, I'm sure, never dreamed there was an American soldier within 100 yards or 75 yards of them. Um, and I didn't expect them either, and we had just been passed by another 50 German soldiers in a combat patrol, and they were heavily loaded with machine guns and mortars. They passed within 20 feet of us. We, excuse me, Jack and I dove into a ditch behind a hedgerow and covered ourselves over, and, Prayed to God they wouldn't hear us, but they were on, on the other side. They walked right on blind and didn't hear us. We're not out there to fight them. We're out there to find those guns and destroy them as quickly as possible. So having found them, we, I said, Jack, you get up on the edge row and that foliage there, and you keep your eyes on those guys over there about 100 yards. And if any one of them, any one of them looks like he wants to come over and see what's going on, you let me be the first to know because I want to stop him right when he turns around. And so Jack says, okay. So I went in there not knowing if I'd find a guard asleep or something. Uh, I didn't find anybody. But what I did find was they were textbook ready for firing. I could not see any evidence that they had fired. Yet historians claim they did. I don't know. I'm not going to argue with the United States Army. I was the first one there, and I didn't see any, any evidence of them that had fired it yet. Yeah. They intended to fire, but I knew they couldn't fire because they weren't getting their, their um, firing orders from the point. So um, I went in, and I, I, each of us, when we climbed that cliff, was armed with an extra special incendiary grenade that became known as a thermite grenade. Uh, this thermite grenade is about the size of a beer can, and with a clip you pull out, and it just pours out. So you, we go over to the traversing uh, mechanism, the gears that move the tube or the, uh, the artillery piece left to right, and then we have uh, we have uh, elevation gears that uh, elevate the tube or the barrel of these big guns. Uh, and then, of course, you have the breech blocks where you put the shells in, and the hinges have crevices around the hinges in some cases. Wherever we could see, it was worthwhile to place one of these special incendiary grenades. We would, I, it was only me there. I took it and I just laid it on it, pulled the pin, and the molten like solder, melting solder, runs out into the crevices around the uh, gears. 
and sets I mean, as the air cools it off, it sets up hard and forces you can't even move it this way or this way or open a breech box. So it renders the piece inoperable. <coughs> so I had Jack's uh, grenade and I had my own. <coughs> so I took out two of the guns of that. Then I took my jacket off, wrapped it around my stock of my submachine gun, and smashed the sights of the remaining three. And I went back to where Jack was uh, uh, guarding me and protecting me. And I said, Jack, we got to go back to the guys and get some more of there. Because everyone was carrying one of these special grenades. So what does it take a couple guys in, uh, 20, 22 years old to run a couple hundred yards? We were pretty fast in those days. And uh, we ran there and stuffed our jackets full of the grenades the other guys had, ran back, Jack sneaked up there on the top to see where those guys were, and they were still there. We were only gone a few minutes. What does it take to run uh, 200 yards or 100 yards and back? Uh, not very long, so we saw it was safe to do what we had done, and so I went over again with, with all the rest of them, and uh, while well, he overlooked uh, these guys, uh, thought just entered my mind, like I can tell you about the uh, yeah, how much armament he had, I'll tell you in a minute. I didn't know this until years ago, years afterward. Um, anyway, I went in and did all the guns. All the five guns were rendered inoperable. And as I was, uh, uh, Jack was saying, come on, man, come on, come on. And I ran over there, and the whole place blew up. And it didn't hurt us, except it threw us all this nine-foot uh, hedgerow into the sunken road. And we got up and ran out to the guys on the road. The coast road was like scared rabbits as fast as we could get. Couldn't hear because of it. What had happened, I thought it was a cell. Uh, you see, we had been shelled uh, horribly by the uh, 88s uh, crawling fire out of the cliff behind us. Uh, I often thought that uh, that uh, crawling fire behind us had ever caught up. I, I'd have been in Berlin the first day running ahead of it, you know, so there doesn't get you. But anyway, um, so we got back there and sent a couple volunteers by different routes back to Colonel Brother, reporting mission accomplished. Now, when our ears returned uh, to normal and I was sitting with Jack that night or the next night, Jack said, it's a damn good thing you didn't need me to fire my weapon. I only had one clip. <laughs> you only had one clip. I said, what, where, what was the round of ammunition? He said, I lost it when we were running uh, down that road. And I don't know where, I just had one clip in my pocket, one clip in my submachine gun. And I said, well, why didn't you ask me for mine? He said, I didn't think about it. So I practically got an unarmed guy up there with one or two clips. We lucked out, listen, I don't want you to think that we're heroes, we're not. We're well-trained rangers that know our job. We were confronted with what we were trained to do, and we did it with our usual expertise. And uh, we were lucky, we were at the right place at the right time. It's as simple as that. But that's what you get when you get uh, top flight guys that are well trained and uh, become outstanding uh, rangers or commandos as they are. Uh, yes, uh, I, can, I think conceited would be the word. Uh, but we were confident that we could do it. But after the landings and after you destroyed the guns, what happened to your unit? Oh, I stayed in the war. You know, the Battle of Normandy lasted two and a half months. And we were at most, most of those big battles in the Normandy campaign. Uh, so we fought all across Europe uh, to Germany. Uh, and. Uh, I was wounded three times in three different bar uh, battles. I, I eventually wound up in Germany with my rangers. And uh, on December 7th, 1944, um, we were given a special uh, mission for the 8th Division. You see, the rangers are generally assigned to different divisions for special operations, for special raids. And going into Germany, we went into the Hurricane Forest for that reason. We had some, well, I guess we did special jobs for about four or five different divisions in the Hurricane Forest. But when you went to the Hurricane Forest, you were a 
officer at this particular time. Yeah, Could you I received had, a battlefield commission? Yes, Could you tell I, us about that? Well, I had been the first sergeant of D Company, 2nd Ranger Battalion, and then I got promoted to the battalion sergeant major, which is the top enlisted man of the battalion. And then, and that was uh, right after D-Day, and then in um, October 1944, yeah, <coughs> October 1944, in Arlon, Belgium, on our way fighting across France and Belgium to get to Germany, they gave me a battlefield commission. I became a second lieutenant. I'm perhaps the only gold bar corporal in the United States Army today because the way the war ended, I never got my silver bar, <laughs> which is what a platoon leader's real rank is, a first lieutenant. Um, that's when I became an officer. October 1944, I forgot the date. After being commissioned, then your unit was sent up, you yeah. and your unit were sent up to the Hurtgen Forest area. Can you describe for our audience where the Hurtgen Forest happens to be? Uh, well, it's along the border of Belgium and Germany, and uh, just a few miles from where the Battle of the Bulge was. Uh, it was the most horrendous battle of the whole war or campaign. Uh, the uh, <coughs> Hurtgen Forest, you know, it was winter time and, and it was the worst weather that part of the world I've ever seen many, many years. And uh, we had to live and fight in snow, ice, and mud, and cold rain, and soldiers were freezing to death, uh, mostly German soldiers, but occasionally you'd find a, an American soldier frozen to death. Um, and a, a great deal of uh, illness and trench feet and, uh, from the conditions that we had to cope with. And of course, uh, one of the worst conditions we had to cope with is that the Germans were well dug in. It was their turf. They had all kinds of bunkers and comforts that we didn't have. Uh, we're just, well, I, I, I came up on a truck with my guys and they put us off the truck about two miles out of Bergstein and uh, we were walking ever since uh, until uh, the battle was over and they come and haul away the bodies and, and those of us had to go to the hospital. Bud, can you describe for us the Battle of Fort Bergstein and Hill 400? Yes. Uh, it, it, you see, in a combat area, you know, the important thing for all armies or troops is to have observation posts. Whether they be in a tower, in a tree, or in some high place, or a church steeple, somebody's got to be looking all the time. Well, at Bergstein, they had the most uh, effective and best uh, observation post there was. Uh, Hill 400, and it had a tower on top. Uh, I think the general, the German general in charge of that, the security of that was Modell, uh, General Modell, or Mondell, or Modell, I guess. And he, um, we had quite a confrontation with him. Uh, the American, uh, the Allied forces were bogged down uh, when we got to the Hurtgen Forest uh, for about a hundred miles across the front, uh, locked in with battles with the Germans. Nobody was moving anywhere. <coughs> and everybody, if anybody's going to win, the Germans won, believe it or not. <coughs> but anyway, um, little by little, we worked our way out of that jam and. Uh, the last, uh, any uh, historians here uh, may remember that um, uh, General Patton ran out of gas, uh, eventually coming across Europe to this area, and had to wait to be replenished with his gas and uh, or his tanks and armed forces. And while they were, uh, they set up these, uh, the Eighth Division and the Fourth Division and. There was about 5,000 guys sent up to take out this Hill 400 because nothing could move in the Ruhr Valley uh, anywhere for as far as the eye could see because of these wonderful observation uh, outpo uh, outposts they had. <clears throat> so 5,000 guys with armor and all the, the backup they needed, or thought they needed, uh, just two or three days before we did that job, uh, failed in taking that Hill 400. 
in Bergstein, Germany. They failed and then they sent for us and we didn't have 24 hours notice. They you know, sooner got all ready to go and said, get on that truck. We got on our trucks and I took off on the night of the 6th. And uh, four, about two to four miles out, they let us off the trucks and said, now go in there, take Hill 400 and take that camp. They take the uh, town of Bergstein and, and the, uh, uh, the uh, German soldiers that may still be there from the last conflict they had. So we did. Um, I took my platoon, and F Company took theirs, and uh, we, uh, uh, F Company and D Company had the assignment for this mission. Uh, in my case, my company commander again was shot up, my platoon sergeant, uh, right at the line of departure. Uh, so I had nobody but myself, a brand new lieutenant, two months standing. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, we assaulted, well before we assaulted, they sent me out on patrol, it's a light patrol from F Company, to reconnoiter this uh, uh, Hill 400 that night, uh, like uh, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, get all the information because it was uh, quite a place, 400 feet high, steep as can be, ice, snow, slippery, and covered with evergreens, and lots of uh, machine gun outfits and uh, fire stations. Anyway, um, so I went to my side. I, uh, D Company had the right side of the hill 400 and F Company had the left side. Uh, it was an assault across a, a hundred foot, a hundred yard, I should say, field, like a football field, of ice and snow into these uh, heavy machine gun emplacements that Germans had at the base of the hill. Uh, well, to make a long story short, um, we took that hill in about an hour and a half time. Chased those Germans up over the top and down the back. My second platoon, I, I became the acting company commander in that situation because I was the only officer in the outfit that uh, was left. Right off the line of departure, we lost our captain and another lieutenant. So I was in charge and, and I'd worked with these guys for so long. Uh, we went over that hill, took charge of it. We uh, had our side of the hill. F Company had their side. To, uh, to shorten this story, uh, we were so successful that the Germans thought it was a piece of cake they were going to take it away from us. Well, they tried, and they tried, with all the counterattacks and all the uh, bombing and shelling and everything. They never could, and that General Modell, he was a high-ranking German general. He offered his troops and his paratroopers two weeks R&R &R, uh, rest up, and each man would get the Iron Cross, their largest, uh, their highest award in Germany. If they took that hill away from us, Germ uh, took a hill away from us, Rangers. Well, needless to say, they failed, and, uh, and then we ran them all. Uh, I only had 15 men left. 15 uh, out of how many, bud? 68. Well, in my company. And uh, to, uh, but we held it. We were only supposed to be on the take it, and we're out of it. We'll have you out of there in 24 hours. They never showed up. We were there 40 hours, and it was horrendous because of the shelling, tons and tons, hundreds, of, uh, hundreds of shells. <coughs> But anyway, we took it, took the town, um, and uh, fought off several of the, my, not my uh, company, I'm on the hill with my guys taking uh, the tower and the, their position. In the town, the rest of my companies on my battalion uh, are getting all the prisoners out of there and it's getting the, that town straightened out and fighting all counterattacks that are coming at them all day. So uh, it was a very bad, uh, situation, but we were very successful. We did a job uh, that 5,000 guys couldn't do. Uh, and then, what you, wouldn't you know it, uh, within a few days the Battle of the Bulls breaks out, the Germans come out of tens of thousands, come down, took the hill away from uh, the 8th Division. See, we turned it over to them two days later. And to, there, there are 15,000 guys. 
and they take it away from them. Now in January, a month, less than a month later, when we drove the uh, Germans back in the Battle of the Bulge, the, I think it's the 508th Parachute Regiment of our American Parachute, took back Hill 400, uh, took them two days and 3,000 men to do it. <laughs> I want to mention that because there's only 68 men in a, in a Ranger company. And uh, we only had two companies, but that's our stealth. We sneak around a lot where they don't know where we're at and kill them before they know they're dead, sort of thing. But uh, we were successful. But during that battle, you were wounded again. A third time. What, what happened to you afterwards? Oh, uh, all kinds of confusion. Um, the, the, uh, uh, those that were, were wounded, uh, we're in a hospital. We had eight operating tables with eight rangers, one on each. And in came our adjutant, who coincidentally will be visiting with me this afternoon at my home down there. And he says, you lucky so-and-so. I said, what do you mean? I'm laying on a hospital operating table. I'm lucky. He says, yeah, we just received word that you and Bob Adlin and George Fitzsimmons, you three guys been wounded at least twice, decorated at least twice. You're going, Eisenhower's chosen 1,200 people off the front. They're going to send you home for 30 days. Well, I got home and I spent a year in the hospital kidding, with all the operations and things. But I never got back. He said, don't worry, when you get back here, you'll have your silver bar ready. And uh, the silver star, I never got either one of them, which was okay with me. I was home safe and the war ended in May. See, this is uh, in December. I may have 45 did. But you're the recipient of America's second highest decoration for valor in combat, the Distinguished Service Cross. Could you tell us why you received that award and who gave it to you? Yeah, well, that, I, I received the, the, the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the highest medal that the Army can award to a, a soldier for valor in action. It is the highest. The next highest is the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is issued by the Congress of the, state, of the United States. That's issued by the Congress, an award by the Congress. Um, I was awarded that a week or two after D-Day for my uh, action on D-Day. Though wounded, I led my guys across the beach and up the cliffs and across the cliffs and all the way inland. I found the guns, found the guns, destroyed the guns single-handedly by myself, Jack covering me with his two clips he had for his weapon. And we never thought to check that out. That's, you forget things, you know. What do I think about my role in history? Uh, I am so happy that I became a ranger and was able to prove myself as a good ranger. Um, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the girl I married. We're married 58 years now and have a big family. Um, what my role in history is, if, if they'll remember that I was a good guy and a good husband and a good father, that's good enough for me, but also a good ranger. <laughs> Bud, thank you, You're sincerely. Welcome. Thank you so much. What do you say we give this show a real fine round of applause?